How does technology or any kind of innovation diffuse in society? How does it permeate, permeate society? So it's not like it immediately affects all society. There's a process. And first of all, I want to recognize that this process is linked to the process of technological change, to something we talked at length about in a previous lecture. So we have a technology that becomes better, its performance becomes better. And then at one point, this technology also diffuses. So we have better technology, and then some of them we take and it's being diffused through society. And I want to start this discussion by recognizing that these two processes are interrelated. For example, here I take a technology, aircraft technology. And here on the y-axis, I took some of performance indicator, it becomes better. This is how much can the airplane transport as fast, so it can transport more faster. Then we go up on the y-axis. And here's the diffusion indicators. How many aircrafts are there and how many miles do they travel? And so that's the curve what you get if you map these two indicators onto each other. And you can see here that at times when performance increased a lot, so I zoom in here in this insert and you can see performance increased a lot during this time. Actually, there wasn't a lot of diffusion going on because actually there was no stable technology. There was just innovation, the propeller technology just came in and we didn't even know what a propeller airplane was. Now, once this was established and we had a thing that we refer to as propeller airplane, a standardized solution, then, okay, so let's agree that's a propeller airplane. And then we sold that thing, right? Then the, then the market comes in and sells that. And so we diffused it. We sold many airplanes and we flew many miles until a new technological innovation struck the, the jet engine came at that point. And then also we couldn't really diffuse it because it was just, what is a jet engine actually? So we, we got upwards, we, we improved technology and later on it diffused it. So both of them play with each other. During times when technological progress improves quickly, the technology cannot diffuse as quickly because it's still in the making. We don't really have a standardized solution to address a typical problem. On the other hand, during times when massive technological diffusion takes place, Technological progress is more stagnant. So it rests on a specific design for the better or worse. Sometimes it's a de jure standard, sometimes it's just a de facto standard, and you know what all of this refers to from our previous sessions. And then we agree on that, might be a frozen accident, and that's the thing that we then diffuse in society. Sometimes a suboptimal solution, like the QWERTY typewriter, and please check out these other lectures where we talked about that, and sometimes, well, even the cutting edge that we then decide and we diffuse. So there's this trade-off between progress and diffusion. Let's look a little bit more in detail on how, how the diffusion of innovation happens. The seminal work here comes from Professor Everett Rogers, a communication scholar from my discipline, actually a mentor of some of my mentors here in the discipline. And he basically said, you know, innovations diffuse through a communication process. So it diffused by us talking about it. And he breaks it down in five stages. First, we get to know about the new technology, then we get persuaded of its usefulness in order to take a decision. We then implement it, take an action, work with the technology, and finally we maintain it. It's really, well, I mean, it's a very interesting and fascinating book to read. I, I strongly encourage you to check it out. It also, when you work in the market of innovations and technology diffusions, maybe in a company that is involved with that, it's very important to get a thorough understanding of how innovations diffuse. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail on the formalities here. I, I instead just gonna walk you, let's, let's look at innov innovation diffuse. In, in a very short time, in three minutes, here on this recording from Derek Sivers, we can see here is an innovator. Well, a lone innovator is not much different from a nut. Like, it's like this crazy guy just innovating here, and certainly he is doing something. All right, and well, there is another early adopter. And you see how he embraces them. So the innovation also has to be user friendly. It needs to be embraced. Maybe the guy just came there to make fun of him. Who knows? We will never know. But now he says like, oh, actually, he encourages others to join. So this is are the innovators. The innovators are very small in crowd. And most of the innovations, they die right here. It's like people's like, okay, these two nuts that actually this technology 
doesn't go anywhere. There's really, there's like, that was entertaining, but bloop, and there it disappeared. It was a mutation that didn't really establish itself. But now check it out. There comes a third and three makes a crowd. And now uh, quite a diversity of user now embraces it and they make their own things out of it especially if it's a general purpose technology, you can use it for many different purposes. And these innovators still hang in there and it's still a high probability of dying. But now come the early adapters. So the early adapters is the in crowd that comes in and it's like, well, now we start a movement here. So we are the first ones who adopt this, I don't know, new thing, smartphone, artificial intelligence for our workflow. And these early adapters now quickly grow. Here you go into the early majority. And that's when it really kicks off. That's You see the steep, the curve of adoption, how steep it is during the early majority. Now the FOMO sits in, the fear of missing out. Everybody needs to join. We go over the 50% mark, look here in my presentation, of market penetration. Now you're actually early, or if you're after that, you are late. So you now have to hurry and you see how quickly people are running to adopt this signal. You wanna be in. You also wanna have a smartphone. You also wanna use artificial intelligence for I don't know what. So it goes very quickly and then we go into the late majority. So now these people who come add on is kind of like you You have to, you have to move on. I mean, most of society is already in the new paradigm. Most society is already using it. So actually you cannot go with them if you don't adopt it. So you don't have another chance. So we call that the late majority that now, okay, finally also has to join and comes and trickles in and then at the end, there are also the laggards. So the laggards, that process takes a long time. And sometimes we never reach, well, in theory, we reach 100% of market penetration, but often we don't, oh, there's still somebody coming. Often we don't. So at the United Nations, when uh, we were working, what the United Nations economists would call universal access is, I discovered it's kind of when 80% is connected. So when 80%, 90% in the best case, has electricity in a country, they would say it's a universal access issue. That's all because you never get, I mean, there's somebody in the mountain range who you won't reach. So these laggards that drags on and actually tempers off and we might or might not get the 100%. So this, how the innovations diffuse. So this curve actually here that comes from Everett Rogers from the diffusion of innovation. And that's how he maps it out. So the innovators are like some nuts, 2%, very high risk of failure. The early majority, once you get in there, you have pretty good chances, but you establish yourself and the early adopters, sorry, 13%. You're now here at 15% when you have both of them and you still have a very high chance of not making it. Now, if you go into the early majority, you get up to the 50% mark here of market penetration and then you made it. That is here than just, you know, milking the cows, selling the things and enjoying the ride. The struggle happens here. So that's how you can imagine it. So where does this curve, the shape of the curve actually come from? Well, the shape of the curve comes from diffusion through social networks. So Everett Rogers was a communication scholar and we can now in our scientific modeling approach, just model how it diffuses through a network. So now I have here a very simplistic network, the most simple network, a grid. So this grid is just a regular grid and let's see how an innovation diffuses here. Let's say we have 100 nodes and we start with the 2% of innovators, we have two innovators. And let's say they, there's a contagion dynamic, this is the same as a virus diffuses in society. And we can say, well, these two innovators, they infect a stable rate of others. So there are two innovators and there's adoption rate of let's say one, 1%. So they now, each one of them affects one other person and gets them you know, into the dance or gets them to adopt a new technology, a smartphone. So now we already have four, double from two to four. Now these four infect on a stable diffusion rate while others. So each one of them again affects one more now. So we are now almost at, at eight if we, we map it out and feel free if you are into that, if that's your thing, to, to rework the math that I show you here. And it's really fascinating. That's that's why I did that. So please stop if you if you enjoy these kind of things and work through the math what I did here with the stable adoption rate, because that's that's the seminal model of the diffusion of diseases, could be 
you know, a disease like a virus, like a COVID-19 pandemic coming out of that, or it could be an innovation. The logic of these diffusion rates is the same. So what I did here is now I mapped this out and these curves, the curves that I showed you before, this logistic curve, the S curve, is basically the cumulative adapters. So I have two, then four, then eight and so forth. And then I reach 50. Now, once I reach 50, I cannot grow anymore because if I would double the 50, I would go to the 100 and beyond. So my stable adoption logic that is this, the same speed of contagion then leads to a decrease in the curve, right? After the 50%. And sometimes you see it mapped out like this, like the red curve. What I did here is what they do here is they map out the new adopters. So here, these two infect two more, then they infect four more, then they infect whatever, 25 more, and then it goes down. So you get this kind of shape. So this is the distribution of new adapters. And this here is the cumulative distribution here into the, that's the mathematical terms from probability theory of, of the distributions. And that's sometimes why you see these two different kinds. So when we look at Everett Rogers diffusion of in innovation, that's the two curves you get. That's the market penetration of uh, the, the innovation. And here you get the innovators, the early adopters, early majority, late majority, and laggards. And then if you think about it in market dynamics, it depends. Do you want to present the yellow curve or the blue curve? So uh, with successive groups of consumers adapting the new technology that is shown in blue, how many people adopt the new technology in a certain phase, its market share, so that's the market share if you're into marketing, will eventually reach saturation levels. So when everybody has the technology, there's no more to sell. So that's, that's where it ends there. Now, that's the prototypical schematic process of the diffusion of innovation. And this is based on a very simple network, a grid. The truth is networks come in all shapes and sizes. So when a, dif when a disease diffuses through society, it's very important that you understand the shape of the network, the network structure. For example, there might be some nodes which are high, more highly connected. For example, nurses or bus drivers who are in contact with many people. So when you don't have a lot of vaccines, these are the ones you wanna vaccinate first because they are hubs who could spread the disease very quickly. Now, you have networks could look very intricate, have very intricate structures. Online communication has very intricate structures. So for example, here, it's a network of the political left and the political right. And you can see the famous polarization that happens when they are in their echo chambers and filter bubbles and don't even hear each other on the two different sides. And the internet itself, I mean, the internet, is, is, is the big net, uh, has, a, has a lot of intricate structure. And the takeaway here is that the diffusion of innovation depends on the network structure and therefore on the kind of network. If you diffuse something like a disease in the analog world, it's very different than something when something diffuses on a digital network. For example, in social media, when something becomes viral, and that leads us to the science of virality. When does something, a post, for example, become viral? If you want to understand that, you have to study networks. Now, I'm not going to bore you now and go into detail with that here because that's not what this course is about. But, well, luckily, I have an entire another online course about this. <laughs> I, I invite you to check it out. A social network analysis a course, which is available on, on Coursera. It's part of the computational social science a specialization and a UC, another UC online course taught in UC online. And you can learn here in basically in two sessions, I think in four hours, we dive deep into the network. So what I want to take here from this course is just an example, just to illustrate to you how the network structure affects the diffusion of innovation. So here I have a network, it's a probabilistic network, and I start to plan my innovation well, with one innovator. So here have my two innovators and they spread this innovation. It diffuses through society. Now, once it hits a node that is more highly connected, it can infect, it can spread to many others. So once you hit more highly connected nodes, some are more highly connected there. There are more popular kids on the block than others, then it can spread faster. But at the end, what I mapped here is the number of infected people. And you can see, voila, we get Everett Rogers diffusion curve. Let's do this again. And we can see if we start, we do that many times in our computer simulations. We can see another kind of shape 
uh, emerge. And this, we basically have the same network shape. We created two random probabilistic networks. And every time we go through that and run through that, we get, well, a slightly different, but still similar diffusion process because it's the, it's the same kind of network that we have here. Now, we can also create a different kind of network. What I do here is I convert the probabilistic network into a preferential attachment network. And if you want to learn more about it, please check out this course here. A preferential attachment network has a, a slightly different structure. It has some nodes that are very highly connected. That is more akin to a digital network. You have in the, in the social media sphere, some influencers who are very highly connected and most of the rest of us is not so highly connected. Now, once you hit an influencer, then the diffusion of the innovation really explodes. Right, so you go back here, let's, let's try to do this again. You start here at a random place and you spread it. And now I hit this influencer here, boom, see how many people get it. That's why they invite the celebrities to shoot the commercials because supposedly celebrities are connected to many, many others. And this structure leads to a faster diffusion of innovation in general, once you have a preferential attachment network versus a, a, a more uniform probabilistic network. And you want to learn more about that, please check check out this course. But long story short, the diffusion of innovation depends on the underlying network structure. Now, in general, networks have become more densely connected over time, especially with the digital revolution. Our communication networks have been more densely connected with the internet, with mobile telephony, with everything else, which at the end leads to a faster diffusion of innovation. So this here is a is historical graph, So, but the general tendency is clear that this is how the telephone diffused, this is how electricity diffused, this is how the clothes washer diffused, and this is here, well, even the microwave or the cell phone or the internet, and actually the fastest diffusing innovation in the history of humankind was more recent. Chat GPT, an artificial intelligence language model, reached 100 million users in less than two months. So that has been, as of record, the fastest diffusion of a technology in history. That's because ChatGPT is basically a web page. It's an app. So it diffuses through the internet. And with that, it was able to diffuse extremely fast. So long story short here, diffusion of innovation depends on the network structure. Networks are more tightly connected, more dense, and hence innovations diffuse faster. Now, this being said, diffusing faster, is it an unstoppable force of nature? They just will diffuse once you reach it? Well, not necessarily. And the analogy of the, of the disease here is very apt because we were also able to stop COVID-19, right? We, we started, we had, we, when we got the vaccine, we started to vaccinate first the highly connected nodes and we broke up the network so the disease couldn't diffuse as, as quickly uh, and as easily anymore in the network. And eventually we threw a blanket of vaccination and of immunity on, on a general society and basically contained it. And we can see that so we can socially construct and we do socially construct the innovation. On the one hand, we can slow it down or stop it like we do with diseases or with some other things. For example, here you see the diffusion curve of the number of beer brewing firms in the United States. And I said, there was a, as, as usually there's a big hype. We saw a big hype here of beer brewing companies. You had 3000 beer brewing, brewing companies here in 1875. And guess what happened during this time? It basically broke to zero. Or let's say officially it broke to zero. That was the prohibition. So it was social construction that intervened here and basically said, no, this innovation, alcohol, will not diffuse anymore. And we can, we can shape that and we do shape that with social regulation, for example. Another uh, example is the inno innovation in the financial sectors. In the 2008 housing crisis, which was preceded by a bubble, uh, a financial bubble, it went too fast. These financial tools that they had and mechanisms that they had, credit default swaps and so forth. And after what they also regulated it in. And the government also stepped in, bailed out the banks, and then the Goldman Sachs average pay got reduced. 
Well, by a little. So from half a million dollar to $400,000, but you can still see that. So, right, it's not a force of nature that the entrepreneurs and the ones that use a new innovation, be it something like credit default swap either, like it's not a force of nature. We can step in as society and we do step in and we do socially construct it in order to try to keep it in, in the range. And the same as we can regulate it, and we will talk much more about it in the next lecture when we talk about how we actually manage socioeconomical change by strategies and by policy interventions. But here I just want to say even something like that seems unstoppable, like the diffusion of innovation, you can socially construct and same as we can with like regulate it down, slow it down, we can also push it up and, and accelerate it. So, for example, here, let's look at the diffusion of bandwidth capacity. So what I did here on the y-axis, I just took bandwidth, fixed and mobile bandwidth up and download. So combined what people have in a country on average available for their fixed and mobile communication. And here we have income, how rich the country is. And what we can see here, well, it's spread all over the place, but some have more bandwidth per capita available than they have income available. So, for example, if we compare two countries, we have here Chile and Norway. They actually look quite similar, right? So if you actually look at them, they look quite similar in their shape. There's Chile, it's a long, and there's Norway, it's a long, thin country. Now, you can see that they have similar bandwidth, about, you know, let's say, 350 something megabits per second. And but you can see that Chile has an income per capita of about $15,000 per year and Norway of 85,000. So you have a large difference in income, but Chile actually well, seems to have put a lot of priority on making connectivity work, despite the comparatively low economic possibilities. They still made it work. So that would be interesting to look at. What, what did they do? in Chile, so it, it worked so well, especially as compared to Norway, uh, or the other way around. We can take these two countries, which are also quite similar in shape and size. So these are two islands, the UK and Japan, and they're also quite similar in, in terms of the income. So they both have similar income, let's say $45,000, but you can see that Japan has much more bandwidth available than the UK. And I was like, I don't know, if you follow me from the UK, I'm, I'm a little wor worried, you know, can, can you hear me? So, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at accents. <laughs> so I'm just very mate, you know, because you like, something's going wrong with the internet connection. Like, look at, look at the mates at Japan. I mean, they, they have twice as much bandwidth and they're not richer and they don't have a country that looks actually very different. They're also on an island there, but they are twice as much connected than, th 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 than my friends in the UK. So, you know, I'm just worried that I hope I'm not stuttering here and I was just, no, this is not, I'm, I'm just kidding. There's not the internet connection, but what you can see here, it would be also too interesting to see what did Japan do right or the UK do wrong in order to advance the diffusion of this technology, which we call broadband communication. And that leads us to the next lecture where we will talk about the digital divide.